Hey, welcome back to the B-Sides Project. My name is Brian, and I'm making a video mess in my shop. If you look at the first episode, I talked about how I'm building a new streaming rig for B-Sides Portland. This is a nonprofit that focuses on building security skills in the community, mostly through conferences and gatherings, which is why we have decided to upgrade our video streaming capabilities uh, from previous years. And instead of relying on equipment from volunteers, try to buy rigs that are consistent, easy to use, and can be uh, easily taught to a new set of volunteers as we try to scale the conference back out. So last time I gave you an overview of the requirements we have for the conference and the video rig I'm using based on an ATEM Mini Pro switcher and some Panasonic camcorders. All right, so the conference has given me a $3,000 budget to build out the new streaming rig. Now that is, you know, soup to nuts. That's new cameras, cables, the switcher, display, cases, pretty much everything but the laptop that runs the control software. And that sounds like a lot of money. And, you know, for a nonprofit, it is. And for a home streamer, it's definitely quite a bit of money. Tons of people are doing Twitch streaming. You would think there's a cheaper way to get into it, and there is. And it's basically just going to be based on what I'm doing with this laptop right here. And I'm going to set up the, the quickest OBS-based streaming setup that I think you can put together for a basic conference video output. It revolves mostly around the laptop, uh, a presenter's laptop, one of my cameras, I'm just going to do a single camera setup today, and some kind of way to get those camera signals into the laptop. Now, your first thought is USB. Yeah, because you've got like a USB webcam sitting around, and you could do that if you were 6 to 12 feet from the stage, which in most conference setups, you're not. Uh, USB doesn't do long ranges very well. HDMI is a better solution for that, but we talked about this last time. 50 feet is the spec limit, 25 feet is kind of practical. But a lot of the higher quality cameras you're going to run into have HDMI output. So we're going to end up using something like this. This is a fairly inexpensive, and I mean like $25 or less, HDMI input to USB 2.0 output device. It is bare bones. Uh, we'll talk about why that's great and a problem in a few minutes. This is not a tutorial for OBS. Boy, the internet is riddled with those. It's great. It's a Swiss Army knife. Even if you're doing some other kind of pro uh, video, have that on your laptop. It's super handy for a number of things, even if it's just screen recording. Let's assume I just installed OBS from scratch. I have one scene. It's called Scene. So let me give it a better name. Let's call this Picture in picture. Scenes are created from multiple sources. Sources are audio, video, images, files, network sources. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff in OBS. All right, so I've got two audio sources that come in right now. One is the microphone off of my computer. Easy enough. I'm going to assume that that is carrying the audio source from the main system, like the, the audio board in the room. It does have an eighth inch jack on this. Some platforms don't anymore. That's sad. There's no video right now. So I'm going to create a picture-in-picture -picture scene, and my first source is going to be a background image. So look at all these sources. Games, displays, slideshows, VLC video sources for, like, playlists. This is going to go to image. This is my background. Browse for a fun image that I downloaded earlier today. Ooh, look at this. It's a security conference. Look how scary this is because there's a lock and some cyber things happening. All right, I want to put some branding for my conference. So I'm going to get another image. Now, this is just like in Photoshop where these layers essentially stack on top of each other. So the source at the top is the source at the top. Let me get this oval logo from B-Sides 2023. All right, and... I'm just going to drag it into, where do we want our branding today? Let's put our branding here, down in the corner. Nice. Now, I've got a presenter on stage with a camera pointed at them, and I've got their laptop on stage with the HDMI output coming out with their slides. So, I'm going to add the camera first. In OBS terminology, that's called a video capture device. So, camera. Now, by default, it usually wants to use the uh, webcam on your laptop. I have the cover closed, but hey, that's what I look like when the cover's open. Let's not do that. Instead, I'm going to scroll down, and my USB video device that I plugged in is called USB Video. Not very inspiring. 
Okay, hey, there's my presenter. He's talking about the safety protocols of using a trebuchet in the desert. He is not a trained professional. Do not try this at home. The one thing I do want to turn on in the settings is use hardware decoding when available, especially if my laptop has some kind of, uh, like Intel QSV is built in for video decoding. If you've got a GPU built into your laptop, turn this on. It'll give you a little bit less of a CPU load processing multiple video sources. So this not only adds the presenter's video, but any audio associated with that source. So now I've got audio coming from the main microphone slash aux jack and the camera. I'm going to mute the camera. That way I don't have an echoey thing with two audio sources. So I've added the camera, but it's taken up the full screen. So I want to resize this and let's move it uh, somewhere over here, over the logo. Okay, so now this is starting to look like that view I was telling you about that a lot of other conferences have. Um, that picture-in-picture -picture style thing where you've got the branding, a cool background, the presenter, and their presentation. Oh yeah, the presentation. i got to add another video device. Let me plug that in. So i got to plug another one of these HDMI capture devices into my laptop to get the presenter's uh, output. And here's where the fun begins. Um, these are USB 2 devices. Um, you have a limited number of the USB-A, the larger ports, on modern systems. I don't recommend running multiples of these on the same USB hub uh, since they're USB 2 devices, even though they're on a USB 3 port through USB 3 hub. There's some potential bandwidth issues, uh, and I don't want you to lose uh, video quality or drop frames. There is a full-size USB port on this laptop over here, one over here, but if I try to plug it into here, I've got an HDMI output. The port's blocked. This is common because these are kind of, they're chunky. So make use of USB short extension cables whenever possible. This is going into a free USB-C port on the side. All right, I plugged in that second HDMI source into the USB port. I'm going to go and get that video capture device, and that's called Presenter Laptop. All right, unfortunately, these are the same budget device. They don't have a specialty driver or anything, so they're both called USB video, but that's okay. You get this cool preview of the slides. Again, I want to check and make sure that my hardware decoding's turned on. And there we are. Now, just like before, it takes up the full screen, and just like before, it adds another audio source. I want to leave that one unmuted. The reason that I'm leaving this audio unmuted is because the presenter might have embedded video or some sound effects or something, so I want to make sure that comes through into the final mix. But I still need to resize this full-size element. So I'm going to drag it, and now let's make our presenter a little bit smaller. So make the slides in the picture-in-picture -picture view a little bit bigger. Okay, this is pretty good, right? It's only been a couple of minutes, and I've set up this complete view. I've got the slides, the presenter, the logo and some background, all clearly presented in one scene. Now, I don't like the fact that I shrank my presenter down so much. So let's assume our presenter is going to stay in place. We're not going to move away from the podium. So what I can do is go to this thing called Transform. And just like in, say, a photo editing software of some kind, when I move this around, it's got position properties. Look. But what I really care about in this case is the crop. So I'm going to take a little bit off the left and right side of the presenter's video. So I'm just going to crop off those edges. Now I can enlarge this. Here, I'm going to close the transform window. I can enlarge this. So now, even though they're picture in picture, I cut out the bits of the room they're not using. I'll center that so it doesn't upset some OCD of the people watching. This is good. It's up and running. It's boring because this is my view. Now, if I want to set it and forget it, it's a great view. But let's say I want to do something that looks a little bit more like the fancy switcher I was showing you earlier. Now I'm going to create, ooh, multiple scenes. This scene is called presenter only. Gee, Brian, what's going to be in here? Well, it's going to be a video capture device, and I don't have to make a new one. I'm going to add existing for my camera. Hey, it's just the presenter. Look at that. So that's the full screen. So if I want to switch away from the picture-in-picture, picture, presenter is emoting a lot, not really referring to stuff on their slides. Maybe they're in the Q&A portion and they're taking questions from the audience. Cut to this. 
Now, if I really wanted to keep my conference branding on screen, what I could do is add an image. I'm going to add my logo. And maybe I'll put that, now I can put that in a different corner, say in the upper left, just for variety. Two scenes. Awesome. Now I also want to add one called slides only. Or eh, say laptop only. In case they bring something that isn't PowerPoint. Thank goodness. Same thing that I've done, right? I'm going to get my laptop only video capture device. Pull from my existing presenter laptop source. Let's say I don't want to put the, the logo on top of this one, right? Maybe the conference presentation uh, is branded already, so I don't have to worry about that. Now I've got three scenes, and when I select them, they go to the output. Here, I'll start recording so you can see what this looks like. This is my main view. This is my presenter only. And this is my laptop only. Now you see in the audio mixer that my mic slash aux is an audio source that's in all three of these. That's super important because as I cut back and forth to these presentation elements, I don't want to lose the audio from the conference. So let's say that I had decided, oh, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and hook the, um, the camera audio up to the output of the soundboard because for some reason it was closer, more convenient. Maybe the camera had a... Uh, an XLR connector made it easy to connect to the soundboard. When I go back and forth between picture and picture and presenter only, I've got that camera audio source. When I go to laptop, because that audio source is associated with a video source that's not part of the scene, I lose that audio. So whatever your audio source is for the conference, unless you're going to something like a, a playlist or something else, then you want to keep this audio source consistent all the way through. The only time I wouldn't want to do that is let's say that I have um, break. Okay, let's say during the break I just want to put up a very basic logo and, and maybe some music. So I'm going to add a source that is an image. I could also add a slideshow, but let's just go with a single image. Break image. All right. And I'll pull up an image file. So. Let's just go with one of the big event logos. All right, and that logo is bigger than the screen, so I'm gonna to go to Transform, Edit Transform, and I'm gonna cut its size down. So this is 1920, 1080. So now I've got this image up, and I could turn down the soundboard, play some music through the speakers, Everything's good. And now I can switch between these multiple sources here. The only thing I don't like about this, this scene view is that I can't see the preview of the next thing I'm going to switch to. The minute I select a scene on the left, it immediately goes live to my recording or to my streaming output. So I want to change that. Now we have this thing called Studio Mode. Studio Mode is the closest approximation in OBS to what I am doing with the multi-camera, multi-input preview on the Blackmagic switcher. So now whatever's on the left is previewed. So I can cycle through these and see if that's the shot I want to take. But it doesn't actually switch until I hit the transition button and it takes the default transition, which is set in the scene transitions here. And usually these are fades and cuts. Nothing fancy. Like a fade of 300 milliseconds is as high as I would normally go. I think 250, a quarter of a second, is a good fade transition. So now I can switch between the presenter and the presentation. Or go back to picture in picture, get my laptop only mode, and when they go into heavy detail on some you know very technical slide with a big diagram, make that slide bigger. When you want to go back to your previous scene, hit transition. And then when they get into Q&A, you know, let's focus on the presenter. And again, when we get to the end of the session, we could fade to black. Or I could pull up the break slide and then transition out of that. And that's our workflow. And for most conferences, i got to be honest, that's going to work really well. And that's why you see this look a lot when you go and look up 
security conferences, open source conferences. It takes a small amount of volunteer power to run this. It's pretty easy to set up on free software and not counting the cameras and laptops and everything, about $50 of additional hardware. So why am I not using it? In the previous video, I talked a lot about the ATEM Mini Pro, right? This is kind of the core of my portable video system. And it's what I've been using some variation of for a while doing uh, outside productions. And if you go to a lot of events, you're going to see this or some scaled up version of it powering most of the video output. I'm a little heavily biased towards these overusing a software solution. Um, partly because I used to write software for a living and software does things sometimes. Now, to be fair, this isn't like there's not gears and levers and stuff in here. This is also software, but it's dedicated embedded software running on a specialized device. This is fairly easy for a new person to pick up because there's big glowy buttons and they do obvious buttony things. Uh, second is, yeah, I'm using $25 capture devices on USB. At some point, I'm going to get to a limit on those, the number I can add to a system before it falls over and dies. So if I wanted to build out, say, a, a small desktop computer and add PCI devices that do hardware capture or get a higher quality of USB device that I think is a little more reliable and might be better optimized. I'm getting to a point where I'm almost buying this device. This Mini Pro, just the basic Mini Pro is $300. The Mini Pro ISO, which is the one I'm probably going to use for the new rig, which does multi-input recording, meaning all four of the inputs and the audio are separately recorded for later editing, is $500. So if I equipped a, a nicely built computer with four PCI Express video capture devices, so I can get four HDMI inputs, and a professional audio interface over USB that would give me two independent audio inputs, I probably spent more money on that than I have on this. And then I'm not relying on the computer to be the powerhouse that does the recording and streaming. I'm relying on this. I could go to a cheaper computer just to run the control software, or I could set it up to where I don't even need to have the computer around once I get the stream key and the configuration loaded in. Um, also, OBS doesn't record all the inputs. So if I want to come back and, and do later editing, this not only gives me all the video inputs, so if I have to cover, say, a, a switching error or something weird happening on stage where I really should be on a different input, I have a better time doing this. I get all the video and audio outputs, and they're in a ready to go in an editing file that's compatible with Blackmagic's editing software, uh, DaVinci Resolve, which turns out is also a free download for the basic version. So in reality, I don't gain that much from a cost advantage if I'm doing a larger production. If I've got multiple cameras coming in, by the time I get those inputs assigned to a laptop, get a laptop that will handle multiple inputs without giving up the ghost, I'm, I'm not saving that much money, maybe $100, $200, and if I go bare bones on the capture hardware, look, I'm, I'm cheap by nature. There are times when you can be too cheap on these things. And you end up saving money on an input device, but you lose money on quality or reliability. So you have to make that trade-off. All the same problems that exist with the setup are going to be there for OBS or for this. I still have to get the video sources to the device. Right, so I still have the same HDMI range extension issue. I mean, I probably could prop this up on stage with the presenter, but that's kind of awkward in a lot of situations. You really should be with the soundboard or the rest of the AV crew on these things. So you're gonna be 50, 100, 200 feet away from the stage. You still need range extension. All those problems still there. All that hardware cost is gonna be there. The cameras really don't change much in cost. You, Unless, again, you somehow strap yourself to the stage, you're not going to be able to use like a cheap USB webcam. You're still going to have to use HDMI or some other kind of output. Now, there's nothing wrong with OBS overall for a streaming setup. In a live production, it's got two other weaknesses that I don't really like. All right, one of the things I don't get in OBS is a full preview of all of my input sources. That's a real advantage of something like a Blackmagic hardware switcher, is I can see all of my inputs uh, right now I've only got one input, but in the previous video you saw I had four inputs plus graphics. I've got my status outputs um, for YouTube, recording time, and audio. So this view is really handy for just doing a comprehensive multi-camera show. The second has to do with if I need a live output for the room. Now the way we're doing the video production at B-Sides, we don't have any specialized output for the room from the switcher. We are counting on the people in the room seeing the presenter live in the room, 
and the stuff on screen. And then anybody who's not in the room gets to see the streaming output. So they get the full production with the input switches and the zoom in on the presenter or you know a panel discussion with the zoom in on those panelists, right? They get all of that goodness from the YouTube output, the Twitch output. If I wanted to go to a slightly more complicated setup where I want to send uh, an output of whatever I'm sending to the stream into the room itself, I want that to be instantaneous. I don't want any latency from that. There's not a great way to do that in OBS because if you say, okay, I'll just run the stream output into the room. Well, now what you're doing is you're taking the output from YouTube or Twitch and putting that back into the room. And there's a huge round trip latency that could be anywhere from 30 to 90 seconds. That's the delay you get through network transmission time and caching between when something leaves that laptop on network connection and goes out into the world and then is able to be picked up by your streaming client. Now the ATEM Mini Pro and Mini Pro ISOs are only have one HDMI output and you have to pick whether that's program or preview. So you could use this hardware output for the room, but you would also lose that for your multi-camera preview, which I just went over how much I absolutely love and depend on that. So you can get one of the larger units that has eight inputs and two physical outputs. Those are the extreme versions of the ATEM Mini line. And in those cases, one of your outputs is gonna be preview, and it's gonna give you your multi-camera preview for the producer, and then one's gonna be program, and that's gonna give you what the audience wants to see. Now that might be going to a secondary set of screens that could be going to an accessibility monitor in the front row. Now in our production, we don't need that dedicated hardware output, but it's available. And it's something that, um, as good as OBS is, it's not really built to do that. It's meant to do the send to the internet thing for an audience that's not in the room with you. So if you need that kind of capability, that's why I like hardware switchers. All right, so that's the quick and dirty way to do this in OBS with some fairly inexpensive hardware. Again, all I really did was download free software and get 50 bucks worth of HDMI to USB inputs to create a multi-input uh, overlay, picture in picture with a presenter and getting audio input from either the laptop or the camera and even embedded video in the presentation. But it has its limitations. Um, I think that the hardware-based switchers are easy to use. Uh, I love having that program preview output. I don't like putting everything on the laptop, which in some productions you own and in some productions is the spare laptop you had lying around the house and <laughs> might crash or die at any moment. OBS is great. I think it's a very versatile tool. It can do some things that hardware switchers can't as far as taking virtual inputs. But for the rest of the project, we're gonna focus on building out the hardware infrastructure. Again, my cost savings between an OBS-based system and an ATEM Mini Pro system is really only a couple hundred dollars. And if the couple hundred bucks is that important to you, yeah, OBS is great. But if you want multi-camera, switchability, remote control, range extension, yeah, if you're going to spend the money on all the bits and bobs you need to do a full multi-camera production, I think you should be leaning more towards the ATEM or a similar product that has big glowy buttons, easy to understand interface, and a multi-camera preview for your producer. Next time on the B-Sides Project, we're going to talk cameras. I've got a PTC camera coming to me from the Amazons, not the river, the, the warehouse thing. We're going to try it out, see if it meets my needs, see if their AI intelligent auto tracking is all it's cracked up to be from just going to wander off camera and never to be seen again. After that, we're going to talk about range extension and how we remotely control those wonderful PTZ cameras so that my lazy butt doesn't have to get up and move the camera around during a production. I just want to sit there, drink my coffee, push the glowy buttons. If you want more information on B-Sides, go back and watch this starter video or visit bsidespdx.org. Find out more about this great organization. Yeah, stay tuned. See what else I come up with in the shop that doesn't generate any sawdust. These projects are so much cleaner than woodworking. So much cleaner.